Hey, this is John. Oh. Welcome to 20 Minutes Underground. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Welcome to 20 Minutes Underground, your YouTube weekly reptile online show for reptile enthusiasts like you. That's why you're here. This week on Underground Reptiles, we're going to look at some geckos that Ryan B is currently breeding, hoarding, and making some extra money on. One of the things we're going to look at is how you can make money breeding and selling reptiles, the pitfalls, the ups and the downs informative video if you're interested if you're a kid like I was a kid and thinking to yourself man how could I actually make money doing this thing I mean this is great imagine selling reptiles for a living imagine doing something you love famous quote by Mark Twain said if you never want to work a day in your life get a job that you really love my life is blessed because I have I get to do every single day what I truly love I have the most beautiful wife, the most beautiful kids. I get to do jujitsu and MMA every single day. And to pay for it all, I get to breed the animals I love. We have an old saying in our Christian world, God is good all the time. Enjoy the show. If you have any questions, we're always here. Feel free to call. If we don't answer your, uh, if we don't answer your uh, comments all the time, it's because we're just a little bit busy. Go figure. Awesome. Hey guys, this is uh, beautiful Sam here and I have your trivia question for this week. This is my friend George. Say hi George. Hello. Anyway, um, this week my question to you is what is a baby roach called? Is it A, a gnome? Is it B, a maggot? Or C, a nymph? What's up guys, Ryan B here. It's been a few months since we talked about some of the breeding projects that I do here from my house. Um, I wanna take a few minutes to talk about our leopard gecko breeding projects. Um, one of the things that we are focusing on here at Underground Reptiles are breeding projects, especially with the leopard geckos, with high color and big size to them. Take a minute to show you guys some of the babies that we've hatched out, some of our holdbacks. As you guys can see here, we use rack system setups. Very, very basic. You got a small water dish. You got newsprint for the bottom. You got a small moss container. That's important. A lot of people think, well, there's no way something that size is going to lay eggs. They're absolutely right. But they still shed and when in shed, they might need some moisture, some humidity to be able to help them get that shed off. Now you can see here, this wasn't a planned holdback. Um, some of the geckos that I'll hold back are geckos that I realize They've lost their tail, some have even lost a finger or toe. It makes them unsellable or at least not as valuable as they could be. So what I automatically do with anybody, even my crested geckos, my leopard geckos, doesn't matter across the board. Anybody loses a tail, toe, anything of that nature, automatically goes into my breeding stock. Why? Well again, you're not going to get as much money for it. but. It doesn't hinder the fact that these guys can be great breeders. So for example, this one right here, this is a Max Snow Tremper Het for Raptor. This is a male. And as you can see here, all that's happened to him is he lost his tail. One of his siblings actually took it off of him when he was younger. Another hold back is the very first dreamsicle we produced. Now one of the reasons why I've loved holding this guy back is because as you can see, it's kind of unusual looking for a dreamsicle. Pattern is a little bit darker and it's a bit heavier. And I talked to uh, Mike Rakowski, um, for those of you guys who know some of the other leopard gecko breeders out there, he said the reason being is most likely because of the incubation temperature at which I incubate. I generally tend to incubate my eggs at about 80 to 81 degrees. So they basically cook for a little bit longer. It's a slower process, takes a little bit longer, but the color that I've noticed that they produce when they incubate longer and the patterning is way more intense. This was a neat little find. I didn't purposely at any point ever purchase any uh, patternless, uh, they call them the Murphy's patternless leopard geckos, but it turns out that some of my parents were het for it 
unbeknownst to me. So this is a Tremper Patternless. Some people call them leucistics. Once we discovered that we had the patternless gene in here, we bred that to our raptors, and then you get what's called an ember, which is basically a patternless raptor. Let me kind of hold it out there for you. Beautiful animal. Now raptors, for those of you guys that are kind of confused by the terminology, basically what it is, is a tremper albino eclipse patternless it's basically it's an acronym raptor and I'm drawing a blank on it. It's like ruby eyed, albino, patternless, tremper, yada yada. Basically what you need for it, you need an eclipse gene, you need an albino gene, and you've got yourself a raptor. It's pretty simple. The answer to the, this week's trivia question <laughs> is C, a nymph. A baby roach is called a nymph. When they're born they they're look, they kind of look like this, but smaller. This is actually a Madagascar hissing roach. We can't sell these in the state of Florida. The one, the one, the roaches we do sell are lobsters, and that's about it. Yeah, nymphs. I want to speak to those that are out there, young kids, maybe not so young kids who are thinking about getting into this industry, this reptile business, and not just as a hobby. It's a very uh, difficult thing because. At first you get into it because you love it, and then you find out, wow, <laughs> you could lose a lot of money. It could cost you a lot of money. It cost your parents a lot of money. And you think, okay, let me try and breed some bearded dragons or some ball pythons. They're easy to breed. And then you get yourself a pair of ball pythons, get yourself a pair of, of uh, leopard geckos, whatever it is, and then you get them to mate, and then they lay their eggs, and then you incubate the eggs, and then the eggs hatch, and you bring them to your pet store, your local pet store, whatnot, and you you put so much time and love into it and you think for sure the guy's going to give me $100 each and he offers you 10 or 15 bucks a piece for him. You figure how much you spend in crickets and your electric bill and all of a sudden you're like, wow, I lost money. I mean, how, much, how many reptiles do you think I'd have to breed to actually make money? Well, it's interesting because a lot of people ask that question, you know, and they get into this thinking they're going to make a living doing this. Now, when it comes to reptiles, especially, I mean, Look around, all this space, and I've got all these cages, and I still could not pay my bills on what I make in just selling tegus and blue tongue skinks and rhino iguanas. I still have to work at my store. I still have to do some wholesaling as well. So unless you are really specifically, like some of the higher end ball python breeders where they're getting four or $5,000 a piece, and the bearded dragons that they're selling for the hundreds, and even that, I mean, you know, if you produce too many of those, you flood your own market. So please understand that it's not, it's not that your animals aren't valuable because you're producing them and you're loving them, but please remember that it has to work out on paper. If it doesn't work out on paper, it's never gonna work. If you just have a, you know, a half a dozen bearded dragons in your house and, and your females are laying eggs, listen to me, if you produce three or 400 bearded dragons a year, you're not putting that much extra money in your pocket. So if you're looking to do this for a living, don't quit your job and start buying. There's some of the bigger people that are out there um, that are actually doing this for a living. They have 10, 15 acres with buildings on it that have nothing. I mean, you look at the, the like the Barchecks, the Clarks, uh, Rep Martin, the Bells. I mean, you look at some of the biggest breeders' names in the world and these guys, they have acres and acres. Bill Branton, uh, man, they have lots and lots and they're buying and selling and they get the chain stores. It is not easy to make a living doing this. Now, you can have a lot of fun. And you can make a few extra bucks, like Ryan's collection. Makes him a few extra hundred dollars a month and it's good for him. He has a section of his house dedicated to it, but he certainly can't quit his job and only take care of his family like that. So be very careful. If you're looking to do this for a living, it's great. It's wonderful that I own a pet store and a wholesale business and a breeding facility, and we do well. God has blessed us, but it took a long time to get to this point. Be patient, be slow, be wise. Make sure you have everything written on paper. Figure out your electric cost, your, your maintenance cost for how lo much time it takes you, your food cost of cost. I mean, if you're, if you're breeding corn snakes, and let's say you have four females, and each one lays 20 eggs, and you wind up with 80 babies. 
Well, you're not going to sell a, a corn snake for much more than 10 or 15 bucks. And after, after you calculate what it costs you for the food and for the maintenance, wow, honey. After you calculate what it costs you for all those things, you got to remember, you still got to pay your bills. Now, if you're doing it for a labor of love and you just want to help the people out there in the world and you want to bring them the finest snakes and you don't want to make no money, hey, <laughs> more power to you. Just remember, it's got to work out on paper. It's a great life to do this. There's no greater gift. That's why we live in the greatest country in the world. Because capitalism in its purest form is work hard, earn money. Work hard, earn money. It's a good thing. We live in, I'm telling you again, we live in the greatest country on the face of the planet. A guy like me who never went to college a day in his life, barely graduated high school, can just work hard, put everything he's got into it, and, and, and the fruit of that labor can take care of my family and 10 other families that work with us. It's a great thing, but you gotta be careful. You gotta invest the time, you gotta invest the knowledge. Work hard. Oops. All right, guys, now I want to take a look at some of the adult leopard geckos. Now, as you can see here, we've got our containers labeled. That's pretty much just to help me remember and know who's where and what's where. You know, you've got dreamsicles and mac raptors, and this one's het for this thing, and that one's het for that thing. And especially since with leopard geckos, I'm sure most of you guys are aware of, there's three different forms of albino uh, strains. Um, you've got your Tremper albino, which creates the raptor, and you've got your um, Bell albinos, which creates your radar. Basically the same thing, but it's a different albino gene and they're not compatible. So you breed a Tremper albino to a Bell albino and you get nothing but normals. Um, so let's take a look at some of these adults now. As you guys can see here, containers are going to be set up a little bit differently than the babies. Um, bigger container, of course. They also get bigger nesting containers, as you can see here. Um, basically, what we've done is we've created these like shallow Tupperware containers, cut a hole out in the center of it, packed it with moss. Females love going in there, digging around in there, laying their eggs. It works great for them. Some of them we've had modified... Uh, moss containers for them to lay in but for the most part that's it this is one of our giant emery and het, het raptors this big guy right here this guy's probably one of my best breeders but he's also one of the most brutal breeders on the females um, got to keep an eye on him now when we do our breeding here i've got to create notes and the reason why is i've got to be able to kind of map out what it is that i want to make and create Again, you don't want to breed stuff together that's not necessarily going to create what you're looking for. So what we've done is we put together a list of the different females, we match up the males to the different females, and of course, as always, you never need as many males as you do females. So you, you can take one male and rotate them out to three, four different females every seven, ten, some people do 14 days. Here we do about 10 to 14 days, it really depends. Um, on the female. Sometimes we'll also skip over a female if she needs a break. Perfect example, I was telling you before how brutal that male can be. This is a dreamsicle female, okay? Great looking girl, but as you guys could see, he was a little rough on her. She got kind of underweight. We've been feeding her up now. We're going to give her a break from breeding for at least a couple months. One of the cool things though about her um, and about leopard geckos is, is that's, you know, just because you give them a break doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to produce anything. They can return, uh, retain the male sperm for a period of time. In fact, she just laid some eggs for me last night. I'll show you guys here. We love to feed them hornworms. Hornworms are a great feeder source for them. There you go, sweetie. Let's see if she's going to take it. There you go. Fattens them up real nice. Got a lot of fat to them. Now you might be thinking for a second, if you look inside the bins, especially these adults, say, why do the bins look so dirty? It looks like they've got this white stuff all over them. Well, especially when you're breeding females, they have a tendency to deplete their calcium. 
So what I'll do, it's not in there right now, but I get these cups and containers, these little shallow cups. We take calcium with D3 and leopard geckos will sit there and just lap it up. They'll, they'll, they'll take little pieces of uh, calcium right out of the dish and that's helpful for them so that they can continue to produce eggs, so that they continue to remain healthy. But the downside is, is they step in it, they knock it over, they kick it around and as you can see here, it gets all over the container. Not the worst thing again, um, as long as you're overall, you're changing your paper out, you're maintaining a clean moss for them, they'll be just fine. So we've got some Mac Raptors. One of the things we're focusing on here, we're trying to produce, as I said before, large geckos, ones with high colors. We work a lot with the emmerines. Perfect example of a, a nice emmerine. Where are you at, buddy? Oh, not there. That's the wrong one. There you are. This female right here. Look at the color on that. Now again, remember what I was telling you guys about regen tails. Beautiful animal like that, why sell it for cheap when you can produce some killer babies with some killer colors on it? There's no point. Hold it back, use it later on for breeding. That's what we've done with this girl right here. This is an emery het raptor. I'm just gonna move you out of there, sweetie, so I can close that. We're trying to produce streamsicles, super raptors, giant raptors, sun glow raptors, those blood lavender emmerines, one of the other ones we're working with right now, radar stuff. Now here's some neat. There's your female. That is an eclipse female het radar. Now you notice how there's dirt kicked all over the place? Male's in there right now. She's probably she's already probably started digging, but she's got a big belly on her. I know she's been grabbing for a little while now. That means that she's going in there. All that mess in there is basically her kicking out some of that substrate so she can get in there and do some laying. So we won't bother her too much. There's the male with her. We'll probably move that male today to get him out of there. Move him to the next one along the line. Another het radar. Some future breeding projects. Here, let me find them. We've got some lavender tangerine het radars. So a little bit more color to them. The lavender, as you can see there, shows up in some of the banding. Real nice looking animals. Still gotta get a little bit more size on them before they're ready to go though. Let me see who else do we have here. And then there's a really nice red stripe het radar. Remember those containers I was telling you about, the calcium? There's one, we gotta add some more in there for her. The yeah, name of the game, real, realistically, when you're trying to breed animals, is simplicity, it's ease of cleaning, it's ease of care, okay? You know, these aren't necessarily the setups that you want to use if you're wanting to keep, you know, uh, display quality animals. It's not, you know, they're not really conducive for looking at your animals and admiring their beauty, but they are conducive for breeding, they're conducive for keeping the animals um, warm, keeping the animals healthy. Um, one of the differences in the two racks, as you can see, just not, not only the size, but there's also a temperature difference. Um, the adults I keep into the high 80s, while the young babies I'll keep a little bit warmer into the low 90s. Babies tend to need a little bit more heat. Now I showed you guys those hornworms that we were working with before. I've also got some other stuff in here. Let me see if I can find it, all this green stuff. Not breeding lettuce or broccoli stalks. Let me see if I can find one on here. There they are, eelworms. See that? Perfect food source for babies. We've also got the beetles as you can see in there. Mealworms turn into those beetles, produce more mealworms, and it's a great continuing source of food for your animals. Now, also one thing that we're particularly mindful of in dealing with um, any type of breeding guys is making sure that you don't have a system that is so rigid that you're not able to um, adapt to a specific animal's needs and what do I mean by that well I've met some people that get some leopard geckos for example or other animals and they want to feed just crickets I just want to go to the grocery store or you know pet store and be able to pick up crickets and that's all I'm ever gonna feed them but that doesn't always work I've got some babies that you see here, they don't want to touch crickets. Others, they don't want to touch mealworms. Others still, the hornworms freak them out. So you've got to be able to know the animal well enough to be able to gauge what is it that the animal wants to eat. You want to keep a healthy fat animal. You want to make sure um, that the animal is not the, 
deficient in their calcium needs. Some of the leopard geckos here, some of them don't need that much calcium. They never take it really out of their dish. They just feed off of the, the, the calcium that I sprinkle on the insects that I give them. Others, they really need that extra calcium. Again, it's about being attentive to your animal's needs. I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit more about what we're doing here, what we're breeding here. I hope you guys are as fascinated about them as I am and uh, I hope you guys continue to stay tuned and uh, enjoy. Hey, this is uh, something we're gonna do here for somebody, and we're gonna we're gonna do a little shout out type deal here. And this is, I gotta tell you, Stenosaurus of the loose. I gotta tell you, Emily, I love you. You are just you're the light of my eye. You're the diamond in the rough, and you're the rose in the big field of dandelions, or whatever the crap romantic people would say. I love you, Emily. I don't know who this Daniel character is. Get away from him. I'm real, man. See his beard? That's real. That's legitimate. 100%. Just. That's. Emily, I love you. Call me. I love you, Emily. You're awesome. I love you, Emily. He loves you, Emily. I love you, Emily. Hi, Emily. All I gotta say is, I love you very much. You're very sweet to me, and that's just the way it is. So just be good, be nice, and I love you. Bye. Hey guys, it's tool time here at Underground Reptiles. No, I'm just kidding. We're over here getting ready for the Daytona show. We need lots of tools. Alex, you're co definitely coming. You guys got that, right? Alex is a tool. Yeah, moving on. Anyways, time for us to pick our uh, contest comment winners. And uh, what will you guys be winning? Look, you guys will be winning the Jurassic Wipes. This guy's a freaking genius. Let me tell you what he did. He took baby wipes at the store for $1.94, took a pack of like a hundred of them, jammed them into something that said Jurassic Wipes, and now we charge $6 a container. This is freaking genius. That's America. Not the land of invention, but the land of ridiculous reinvention that just robs people of their hard-earned cash. Our contest comment winners, the three of them. First up, we got the uh, Snake Mano. He says his favorite book was uh, Reptile Eyewitness. It's a good book once you get over that evolution nonsense, he says, and then uh, gives you great tips on how to find an inbred, evidently. He says he found his under a bucket of KFC and now wants to know what kind of tips we can offer to help his inbred get tamed down. Well, I recommend lots of candy, sweets, and a good beard comb. Because the inbred loves a good beard comb. And then finally he says, uh, Moody Booty, I will give you $60,000 signs for the invisible bearded dragon. Next up, we got the Fish Guy 86. He says the best reptile book is the Galapagos Islands, a natural history guide. Says some of the most breathtaking pictures and facts are in it. Yada yada. If I'm not mistaken, isn't the Galapagos Island just north of the Key? It's like Key West? It's that island right above Key West? I definitely agree with you, Fish Guy 86. There are some strange sights to see down in the Keys. No question about that. Lots of weird tours, weird, weird things. Andrew frequents it a lot, don't you, Andrew? Hey, shut up. And finally, we've got uh, Key Rettles. Says, never imitators, always innovators, the greatest reptile experts, underground reptiles. Can't wait to make it from Vegas to Florida to meet the icons. What he meant to write was icon, because there's only one, and that's your pal Moody Booty. I know what you mean, Gretels. Whatever, you want to come visit us, and you want to come visit your pal Moody. 
I'll be waiting for you, buddy. And then finally, to conclude this episode of uh, Moody Booty, just giving away free crap, I have to give a shout out to uh, some young man that posted on our YouTube page something about wanting us to tell his girlfriend that he loves her. What was his name again, Andrew? Daniel Hines. Daniel Hines. Let me start off by telling you, Daniel, that I love how ridiculous your request was and how sad it made me that you would post on YouTube that you want us of all people to tell your girlfriend that you love her. I love how pathetic that is. And Emily, we also love your compassion and your willingness to stick with such a uh, pathetic individual. Kudos to you. That's it for this week's episode of Moody Booty. I guess they also call it 20 Minutes Underground, but we all know what you guys really tune in for. We're done here. Now get out because we keep getting interrupted as you can see here. Now come on in, interrupt the oh, Come away. on in, why don't you interrupt me? Right. I got peanut butter in my throat. Hey guys, look. Half human, half giraffe. It's impressive. Take it easy, guys. Go away. Now, be gone. That's 20 Minutes Underground. We hope you enjoyed the show. Last week's question of the week was, uh, for me, very nostalgic. A lot of you guys brought up books. You guys have talked about the Peterson's Guide and the Audubon Guides and some of those old-time books and the new books that I didn't even know existed. It was great, man. Thank you so much, guys. This week's question of the week coincides with the very animal I got in my hand. What's the coolest new animal you see coming up? You heard about, you saw. Now for us, it's, uh, it's this little boy right here. This is the panda dragon, otherwise known as the white pectinata. He's a little grayer because he hasn't shed off his winter coat, his uh, summer coat yet, but when he sheds, he's all bone white. You can show him some of the pictures of the other ones over there. What's the newest one? For me also, it would be our, our, pan, our, um, our purple tiger tegus. I was watching um, Snake Bites this past week, and I saw that uh, he was playing with this boa. It was just some one of the sickest black, a pure black boa, sickest thing I ever seen. Man, I would love to have one of those pure black boas. What is it? Where? Where'd you see it? And what is it? What's the coolest thing you've seen lately? Anywhere. We want to know. Thank you so much. God bless. And as always, whoosh.